Welcome to Dear Diaspora, a podcast celebrating the African diaspora and the change makers, innovators, and entrepreneurs working to make our world a better one to live in. I'm your host, Ndola Koa. Let's get started. So before I introduce the next guest, don't forget to leave a review, subscribe, and rate on Apple Podcasts. It makes a huge difference, and one key way that it does that is people are more likely to check out an episode or two if they see that there are ratings and if they see that people are actually listening to the content and enjoying the content, and uh, one way to show that you enjoy the content is by leaving a review so for everyone that's left a review thank you so much i really appreciate it and if you are listening on any other podcast listening platform please make sure you follow the podcast so you're notified each sunday when new episodes come out and lastly if you're listening on spotify you can actually share the podcast that you listen to on instagram stories just like you would a song so if you're listening to dear diaspora on spotify you can share that in your insta stories and i will repost um, so of course tag dear diaspora and i will repost and really appreciate you spreading the word about the podcast happy sunday everyone and welcome to episode 32 of dear diaspora Thank you so much for tuning in. I am so excited to introduce my next guest, Isaac Sessi, who is the founder of Sessi Technologies. Sessi Technologies is a Ghanaian company that's solving agricultural and food challenges, and they are best known for their product, GrainMate, which allows farmers and grain purchasers to affordably measure moisture levels of maize, rice, wheat, millet, sorghum, and other staples. Sessi Technologies is solving quite a significant problem. According to the UN Food and Agriculture Organization, more than 20% of Sub-Saharan Africa's cereal output is lost or wasted, often because grains aren't dried sufficiently before they're stored. So during the episode, Isaac walks us through what it took to build GrainMate and how he's actually working to make it more accessible to farmers through innovative payment methods. He walks us through his background and just what really got him interested in using technology uh, to solve problems. He also shares more about raising money for GrainMate and how he's actually been able to raise about 120000 for his startup through winning pitch competitions, which I thought was super interesting and unique. He has worked with Ghanaian subcontractors to build all the components for GrainMate, which I also thought was super impressive. He's not relying on, you know, outsourcing to China or anything like that. You know, everything was built by Ghanaian. So for those of you that have been following the podcast for a while now, we are all about African solutions for African problems. And so it was really encouraging and just inspiring to hear from Isaac um, about how he's gone about building this company. Um, he's, you know, making sure that Ghanaians are employed. He's working with Ghanaian vendors and, you know, makers. And so that was just super interesting. Um, and I can't wait for y'all to listen to the episode. He also walks us through how he's teaching young people how to code through a foundation that he started a few years ago. And these young people are learning the code on their mobile phones, which also is super impressive. So just, I cannot wait for y'all to listen to this episode. Here is my conversation with Isaac Sessi. Isaac, thank you so much for being a guest on Dear Diaspora. I am so excited to have you. Uh, Welcome. Thank you. So happy to be here. Absolutely. Glad to have you. Let's get started by getting to know a bit more about you. So where are you from and where did you grow up? Uh, Once again, my name is Isaac Sessi. I come from Ghana. Uh, I grew up in Accra. That's the capital of Ghana. Um, I lived there. I was born there and I lived there the first 11 years of my life before my family moved over to a small town called Kaswa in the central region of Ghana. Um, I went to high school there. 
and then I took a gap year to work to save money to come to the university and so I went to the second biggest university in Ghana is called Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology, um, which was recently the best university in West Africa. So, yeah. Anyway, so I studied like electrical engineering there, um, which was my passion because back in high school, I'd always loved things, building things with my hands. So I built some cool projects. I built dishwashers. I built... Um, clothes drying systems. I built um, communication systems for my school's science and math quiz team. And so I came to the university to sort of improve on that skill. Uh, I did electrical engineering. Unfortunately, it didn't go the way I thought because uh, there was a lot of focus on too much theory. And so I sort of took my own way. I found a bunch of nerds who were also into building stuff. And then we, we taught ourselves how to we taught ourselves engineering, actually, and then how to, you know, code. And um, through that, I, I, I founded my first uh, startup, which was an electronic component retail company. I founded my next startup, which was a software engineering company. Uh, and then I got the opportunity to work on a research project in one of our departments, which has led to what I am currently doing now, um, building technology for farmers. So, yeah, in summary, that has been my journey. Awesome. Thank you for that. And would you say, like, what do you think sparked your interest in, like, problem solving and, like, building things? Like, did you know, like, you know, someday I want to be an entrepreneur or was it just like you just kind of like to experiment with things? Well, for me, it had been more about trying to solve problems. Uh, I grew up in pretty hard times. I, I, my family faced a lot of, you know, tough crises. There were times where it was difficult to get food to eat. And um, I grew up realizing how such a big problem globally that was. And I, I had this curiosity in me that wanted that move me in the direction of trying to help people, trying to solve problems. Um, so combined with the passion for actually building stuff, I was like, what about building stuff to solve problems? So um, for me, that's, that's how it came about, the desire to build stuff to, to solve problems. Mm. Wow. And so could you walk us through GrainMate? Um, so I, I did some reading about it and, um, I would love for you to share more with the audience, just like what it is and maybe a little bit about your journey, like building it. All right. Okay. Uh, so I'm going to share some background story about grain mate. So grain mate is a grain moisture meter that makes it easy for farmers, businesses, and anyone working with grains to easily measure the moisture content in their grains before storage or before feed preparation or before uh, doing whatever they want to do with their grains. Um, it sounds pretty simple, uh, but then let me just, you know, make you understand why this is important. So in Africa, most of our food is produced by smallholder farmers. And um, as much as 30 to 40% of this food or this grains produce is lost to post-harvest losses. And one of the major causes of post-harvest losses is too high moisture content in grains. Um, farmers do not appreciate, are unable to appreciate the, the effect moisture has on their grains. Um, they are unable to efficiently test for the moisture content in their grains and as such they they suffer all of these losses and mind you um the farmer is this small order farmer is typically making less than 200 dollars uh for a whole year of um farming so imagine having to live on 200 dollars for a whole year it's it's pretty crazy and now imagine having to lose 40% of that income because of something that was absolutely preventable, like moisture. Mm -hmm. So 
essentially, um, the tool that we develop help these vulnerable people to be able to know whether their grains were dry enough um, for storage or have to be dried some more. And the simple knowledge of this could be the difference between a farmer and his family going to bed hungry or having dinner to eat. So back in the university, I worked with the departments of agri engineering um, on their research projects to discover uh, the problem of post-harvest losses and explore simple tools and solutions we could uh, build to um, address this problem. And that was where Green Mates came from. It started as a research project. Um, my unit was supposed to 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 uh, de develop the the device and um, explore local assembly in Ghana. And we successfully did that. And the next step was to commercialize it because the project had ended and we didn't just want it to be a research project uh, that ends um, just like that. So I started my company, Sessi Technologies, to commercialize the grain made grain moisture meter uh, as well as discover other pressing problems that farmers are facing and develop low cost uh, affordable technology solutions to um, that problem. So that is how Green Mates Moisture Meter came about. Wow, that is so cool. And I read that, so typically like a, a moisture meter would cost like, let's say like $400, but then you were able to create it for, um, and like I think your your meter sells for like $80. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So even on the um, open market, it's selling for hundred dollars currently, which is first of all um, several times cheaper than other solutions out there. But um, for us, we we even looking at um, even at hundred dollars, that's still a very significant amount for a smallholder farmer. So one of the things that we have done is to work with farmers at a community level. Um, one of the things we discovered recently when we went on um, a tour to speak with, with 38 smallholder farmer groups across Ghana is after telling them about the, the problem, the solution we have developed, um, and wanting to find out how many people want to use the solution, we had over 95% of people saying, we want to use this. And interestingly, they were like, hey, um, if you can make us pay in installments, that would be awesome. So even aside trying to lower the price for farmers, we're, dis we're discovering and implementing ways in which we can make it possible for farmers to actually get access to it. So um, working from a community level, um, they're able to pay in installments. In some cases, they can exchange um, some grains or some produce for some bags, uh, I mean, exchange a couple of bags of, of corn or something um, for a grain meat. And um, this is like feeding into a, sit, a, 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 a setup that they already have, which is um, the fact that they are used to butter trade, exchanging things for other things. And so we're like, yeah, fine, we have reduced it by up to four times, but how do we go further to make sure that you are able to afford it? So um, that's another thing we're doing, making it easy for them to be able to, uh, get, to get access to it through innovative uh, payment me methods. Wow. And how many people um, or how many farmers are currently using the tool or the, the meter? So, yeah, so currently the tool is, is, is in use at the moment by about... 800, 800 farmers in Ghana, um, but these are just farmers alone. In addition to farmers, there are um, poultry farmers, there are grain traders, there are food processing companies um, across Ghana, Nigeria, and Kenya that are already also using grain mates as well. Wow, that. That's amazing. Okay, so you managed to work with Ghanaian subcontractors to make the components for Grainmate. 
How important was that for you and how can other companies do the same? Well, this this was a very, very hard thing to do uh, because usually when you're looking to build electronic devices, every single person in the world will tell you, outsource this over to China or outsource this to a Chinese company. And um, there's so many good reasons for that. So working with a Chinese company, labor is cheaper in China. Uh, getting electronics built is, is cheaper in China. Um, they have all of the supply chain and all of the systems, equipment, tools, um, human resource, everything figured out. And so we, uh, as part of our core um, values, we, we really desire that we have innovation coming out of Africa. And so going outside of conventional wisdom to try and get things done in Africa, especially in Ghana, was actually really, really difficult uh, because it was... Uh, it, there were not enough people to find who you can sort of outsource some part of production to. Um, labor is very skilled. Engineering labor is expensive here. Um, you don't have the equipment. You have to import raw materials. You have to pay so much money on duties. Uh, and even power and electricity is not reliable. So going, going, um, outside of conventional wisdom to get this done was actually is actually one of the craziest things we have done. Um, so mm. it happened that one of the things that um, I w- one of the things that helped for me was that because I was already plugged into a network of engineers in Ghana, I could find people that I could sort of hire on a temporary basis to come and help with our engineering and manufacturing efforts. So I did that. I also found, I also went to the market and I found someone who, a local guy who makes bags uh, to make the bags for the packaging for our meters. Um, I spoke with someone who knew a carpenter who could make a certain part of our, our handles and basically just looking around to, to look at what we can improvise and what we could do to ensure that as many jobs as possible stay in, in Ghana. And so let me take, for, for instance, the local guy in the market who makes our bags. Um, at the time he started working with us, he was at the verge of closing up his shop because he was not getting enough uh, you know, work to do. And... Um, he didn't have money to renew his rent and it was a big problem to him. And so we started working with him. One of our friends also started with working with him to make bags and um, for the, the products we were producing. And within three months, he was getting so much work. He had to hire another person yes. to come and join him because the demand, work demand for him was actually a lot. And his wife even came over to the office just to say thank you to us. So wow. it, it, just being able to, you know, keep jobs locally and find, uh, even in the difficulty, find uh, resource, human resource in Ghana to get some of the things done is actually very, a very, very beautiful thing to us. Um, instead of just going by what everybody is going for, and sending everything to China. So I'm like, I'm on engineering forums. I'm like, hey, I'm trying to buy this equipment for a low volume production in Ghana. And what do you advise? Do you recommend this equipment or that equipment? And then the first response I get is, hey, why are you trying to do this in Ghana? It doesn't make sense. Send it to China. We're not recommending any machine to you because it doesn't make sense. So this is like the magnitude of the the situation we're dealing with and how beyond what makes sense we're going uh, beyond that to try and keep jobs in ghana to try and you know develop technology in ghana so yeah um it's been one one hell of a ride but we're happy with what we've been able to do just seeing the smile on people's faces alone um the fact that we're able to hire all of these people and put money in their pocket makes us so happy absolutely wow and so 
what would it take for more companies to work with um, local subcontractors and local vendors? Like I know you said, you know, China's got everything all developed and, you know, they have all of their systems in place. The supply chains um, are all set up. So like what what would it take to make it easier to work with local people? Well, I think first of all, for companies, it will take a change in mentality. Um, it will take an embrace of trying to do good, trying to do social good, and putting themselves in the line to be the sort of guinea pigs and the, the ones who experiment with new things that may or may not go well, and they should be comfortable with that. Um, That's the first thing. The second thing is there are people out there. uh, You may not have it exactly how you want it to. But then if you're looking for people uh, to outsource at least some part of your work to locally, there are people out there that can help. Um, uh, Fortunately, the ecosystem is building up. Um, We have have, uh, our version, local version of Fiverr or Freelancer, uh, where you can actually hire people to do temporary work for you. Um, you have We have our own version of um, Andela, where you can actually recruit uh, tech talent um, to, to, to help you with um, your staff. Even in the informal sector, if you ask people, you find people who can do things. Yeah, so I think that that's it. First of all, embrace the fact that the um, have the fact that it's important to do social good as part of your your your, your core values. Otherwise, well, anything you do is probably not going to make any business sense. And then, secondly, plug yourself into the local network, uh, and then you'd find people to to help you with stuff. It's 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 so amazing, um, especially if you go on LinkedIn. Uh, how much information people are willing to give to you and how much people are willing to help um, just because they, they, they met you on LinkedIn for, for no reason at all. And it's been one of the greatest um, sources of, you know, finding um, people to work with locally that I have, I have had because people know people who know people. And I have found out that there's a study which says that uh, you're only five or six degrees of separation from anybody in the world. So for anybody in the world, you, you just have to know five five people and then that person knows the other person in the world. So uh, people, it will surprise you how much people know people. Yeah. Seriously. Wow. Thank you so much for sharing that. I, I think it's really important, like even though it's difficult at times to, let's say, um, work with, local vendors or or contractors i think we have we have no choice but to be more intentional about it um because i think it's it's a little dangerous to continue to rely on just saying oh we're just gonna outsource to china like that's that doesn't really aid yes exactly development Um, exactly and this whole issue of COVID 19 is unraveling how uh, extreme dependence on China for everything is dangerous. Mm-hmm. Yes, man. And so, so you built, or you, um, so you launched Sesi Technologies to commercialize GreenMate, correct? Yes. And so, could you walk us through, like, going from it just being like a project or a research to actually commercializing? Like, what would you say was your your biggest challenge making that transition? Uh, well, so, you know, we're actually two years old, just last week, Saturday, which was a big thing for me, looking at how far back we have come. Um, I think that when you're working in a project, there are a lot of things you don't have to think about. You don't have to think about funding. You don't have to think about paying people because all of that is, is taken care of by the project. But now when you set out to build a business, it's a whole different ballgame altogether. First of all, you have to go look for money. 
Secondly, you have to build a team. Um, thirdly, you have to to start actually uh, doing marketing and looking for business. Fourth, you have to figure out how to build the product. And uh, these were th- all of all these things were things that were quite new to me. Um, because typically I am reserved. I like to be in my corner doing my own thing. And now I am just suddenly thrown in the limelight where I am responsible for building a company and I am responsible for um, managing people. It was like that, that shift from just being a guy in the lab to running a business and hiring people and managing people was like really really difficult for me and it's something that I, I i am still learning by the day um the the other the most the other difficult part was actually looking from looking raising trying to raise money um to keep this going now we find ourselves in a position where we're sort of pioneering the local hardware industry which does not exist and the investors that we have locally really do not understand our industry and we may run into situations where there is a, a mismatch between what investors are looking for and um, where, where investors want to go with us and where we want to go. And we felt like the best time for now, the best time to raise um, money from investors was not now, which meant we had to look at other forms of raising funds. Uh, in, if you live in Africa, you're very, very, very limited by how much money you can raise and where you can raise money from. And uh, one of the things that we did is we entered into a lot of innovation competitions and these are really competitive. You have as much, as many as um, 5,000, 10,000 people applying for a single um, competition or grant where only one or two people are going to be um, winners. So I think in tw- between 2018 and 2019, I applied for more than 30 of these um, wow. com- competitions. And, you know, you can imagine how um, all of the disappointments were when you receive the email which says, thank you for your application, but we are sorry. And you don't even want to re- read the rest of the email. Uh, but on the bright side also, we've won about four of these, which is like incredible. Comparing the odds, um, comparing the odds, of actually being able to win them and having won four of those, that's like really incredible. And put together, we, we raised about uh, $120,000 from these, uh, which has really is really what has kept us going. And so the whole process of being able to, to, to um, package the problem you are trying to solve and projecting the solution and articulating the solution in, in 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 such uh, a very understandable way uh, in a crowd of people that are watching you from all over the world and having to do that against other very very um, established <laughs> entrepreneurs also from the rest of Africa and sometimes the rest of the world it was really another really difficult part of of this whole journey so um, sometimes when I feel that I, I'm t- I feel too hard on myself uh, for some mistakes we make. I also look at these and I, um, I ask myself, hey, what were the odds of being able to do this? And I give myself a pat on the back. So it's not been an easy journey, and uh, but we're, 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 it's two years and we're still alive and we're doing well. So I guess it's been worth it. Wow. Yeah, congratulations on um, getting to the two-year mark. Um, yeah, thank you. Yeah, looking forward to all that you will keep doing to innovate, um, especially in the agricultural industry. Um, so what other sort of problems have you noticed now, um, particularly in the agricultural industry, now that you've kind of developed a solution for like, you know, to measure like moisture levels like what what's like your next thing that you that you would like to address Uh, so at the moment we're focused on the grain post-harvest loss value chain um, which is still a really big area in terms of um, 
problems we can solve and potential solutions we can we can come up with so we have a and if you notice if you look carefully you realize that one of the things you have noticed is that a lot of the problems are interrelated so mm. we're solving just a tiny bit of the problems that exist along the green value chain so even before uh, being able to test for moisture there is a problem of drying being able to dry effectively after testing for moisture there is a problem of being able to uh, to store after being able to store there is a problem of being able to sell um so as day in day out as we are speaking with customers as we are speaking with farmers as we as we are speaking with stakeholders we take note of the problems that they face and then we have developed a product development uh uh, framework where we look at all of these problems and then we through our framework we, we, we try and find out what is the next uh, most feasible things to work on so at the moment we have a number of things um, on our radar uh, where we're, we're developing we're researching on solutions for drying we're researching on solutions to help farmers sell their grains um, we're researching on solutions for testing for aflatoxins inside of grains. And this, this aflatoxin, this problem of aflatoxin um, is a major problem in Africa, um, which affects grains. Um, so aflatoxins are basically microorganisms that beyond a certain acceptable level, uh, they are very harmful for anyone who consumes them. And a lot of liver cancer cases in Africa uh, a majority of liver cancer cases in Africa can be attributed to aflatoxin contamination. And so um, we're developing a solution to, to mitigate that as well. Um, yeah, so that, those are just a few things on our radar for now. Um, so we, we just looking at the problems makes us excited because we see them as potential um, opportunities to actually you know, solve and uh, create value for everybody involved. And are there other ag tech companies in Ghana or across the continent that you have kind of gotten in touch with to kind of learn about their work or just share ideas? Like, have you done any of that? Yes, yes. So we are actually within a... A, a large community of ag tech companies um, that are trying to solve problems in in Ghana alone. Um, I can count about f- about 15 different ag tech companies that are trying to solve um, problems, and I am I am friends with the CEOs of about five of them, uh, and then we we talk regularly, share ideas, and then look at how we can work together. Uh, globally, I am uh, where we we are plugged into a network, a community, um, where we're learning from each other, we're learning about problems that exist in other places and opportunities for collaboration. Yeah. That's that's really cool to hear. Yeah, that's that's so awesome that you guys are not seeing each other as, you know, competitors per se. You're, yes. You know, you're all yes. working towards um, solving a... That's a big, same goal. Yeah. Big it's, goal, yes. And it's such a, a huge problem um i would say or at least the the agricultural industry on the continent is so like it employs you know the most amount of people and so it's like there's i would say there's plenty of room for innovation um and everyone can can kind of play a part in that and it doesn't have to be just just one person or one company Mm mm-hmm and so could you share a bit more about some of your other projects? So you mentioned um, earlier that you are also um, working to teach people how to code um, using mobile phones. Could you share a bit more about that? Yes, yes. So um, outside of CESI Technologies, there are a number of other things I'm passionate about. One of them is STEM, Science, Technology, Engineering, and Math. And while I was in high school, I actually founded a, a nonprofit with my friends called Insisa Foundation. 
So in Sisa is the Akan word for change. Akan is a language that is spoken widely in Ghana. Uh, and then the goal was to do what we call, um, we define our goal as trying to spare an innovation revolution um, and create a, a state where young people across the world, um, especially in Africa, are solving problems with science and technology. So um, together with my friends, we run a number of programs during the year under the nonprofit. Uh, one of it is called Project Ice West. So Project Ice West is a, it's an annual summer camp um, where we, we train 30 high school students in electronics, in, in, in microcontroller programming, uh, in computer programming, in innovation and um, in entrepreneurship. And within three weeks, they sort of use all of these skills they learn to develop, a, to identify a problem and develop a prototype solution to that problem and present uh, to their friends, parents, the general public, and to judges. Um, so out of this uh, project, Ice West, we had one of our programs, um, the mobile mobile phone tra training, um, mobile phone coding program come out of it. So what led to actually creation, creating the, a program to teach people how to code on mobile phones was because was, um, was this, that during our um, Project Ice West Boot Camp, um, what happened was a lot, of a lot of the students that came in did not have laptops to learn how to code. Uh, and we're like, what if we can use phones to teach how to code? And then we discovered a very ingenious way, a very ingenious way to actually do that. And it turned out that most people had smartphones, even though they didn't have computers. So we're like, hey, let's actually expand this and um, teach people how to code from their phones. So we, we, we expanded that program and called it Sunya Code. So Sunya is the Akan word for learn. So essentially learn code, where we teach uh, people how to code from their phones. And um, last year, we had, we, we, we doing our, our latest um, training, our latest cohort, we had over 2,000 applications from across Africa, and then we trained about 300 uh, of these applicants um, to learn how to code from their phones. And many of these people completed the course. We had about 78% completion rate of people who were learning to code from their phones. And then a lot of them came back as volunteers to help train another cohort. So it's, it's one of my passions to actually see people solving uh, problems with science and technology, and that's how my friends and I are solving it through our um, Isusa Foundation um, nonprofit. Oh my goodness, that that is so amazing that it's volunteer run. You got two thousand applicants. You've trained three hundred people. That that's pretty phenomenal. Um, and yeah, the seventy-eight percent completion rate—that's also really great. How? Yeah. Like, so once someone completes the the program, the mobile phone coding program, what are they able to do? Like, what sort of skills do they develop? Well, so um, that is so our mobile phone coding program is actually an introductory coding um, program. It's, the goal is to introduce you to programming and build in you the desire to want to learn more. And uh, a lot of the people who have gone through this program have actually gone on to take even more um, complex coding programs and have really built their skills. And I want to share one example. So we had one student in 2014. At the time, he was a high school student. Um, take our um, take this program, and at the time he had absolutely zero knowledge of coding. That was his first experience coding. After going through the program, um, he went to the university. Uh, in his in his second year, he got the opportunity to um, do his to to he got admission to New York University. So he went to start first year again, and then he kept on improving on his coding skills. And today he is building. Um, Part of the code he is writing 
is being used on devices and equipment that are running on Mars at the moment. So that's like really incredible. And when he is he's writing about the stuff that he does, even those of us who taught him how to go, go like, hey, dude, speak English. So, <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah, that is, that is, uh, and then he comes back and he is very grateful for us introducing him to, you know, coding. So essentially, our, our coding program just introduces you to coding, builds in you the desire to take it further. And those who really take it further have seen a lot of success. Um, we had, we had um, a number of students that went through our program who continued to improve on their skills. And then they came back to help us build a platform to run the course because we had, we had outgrown the initial platform, Google Classroom, that we were using to run. And they, they, they if first were sort of um, grading all of the assignments um, manually. And now when we started working with so many people, it became difficult to grade manually. And then these same people who took the course came back to help us build an AI tool that automatic, automatically grades courses. So, yeah, that's, that's like the, the output that we have had from this course. Um, introducing people to code, they build their desire, they learn more, and now they are doing amazing things. Oh, my goodness. Uh, that, is, that is just so amazing. Um, I'm, like, mind blown right now. Um, so how, like, can this work for younger students as well? Because I'm thinking of, like, you know, elementary school students are they able to would you say this is a, a course that they can take as well uh, well at the moment um you know since we started with high school students um we've, we've actually had some people in grade seven grade eight um joining as well uh but the the, the problem with africa is that usually you don't have access to a phone until you are around high school. Mm -hmm. So um, the course has is currently tailored to high school and above, uh, so around high school level. Uh, but then going forward, um, when we see it, that it is feasible, we can, we're, we're, we're really happy to tailor the course um, to even younger you know, learners. And the, the, the nice thing about our course is that it's actually very visual and very basic. So um, you're able to see the output of your of what you are doing um, in a very visual manner, which is really stimulating, especially for, for younger people. So going forward, we're looking to um, make it possible, if it is feasible, for even younger um, learners to be able to, to learn. Wow. And so because this is a nonprofit, people, people don't have to pay? Um, well, because so 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 far we've actually been funding um, the whole nonprofit through grants that we receive and grants we apply for. Uh, but as time have, has gone on, um, we have been we have been exhausting all avenues to raise grant funding, and we've been forced to figure out how to you know generate some um, income to keep the the nonprofit going and so what happens is that we charge a basic fee to attend the, to take in uh, to take the course but then for those who are unable to pay we waive off that fee and we give them scholarship so people who can pay they pay for the course people who can't pay when you are selected we give you a scholarship to take the course oh my goodness and if someone is listening right now and wants to uh, donate or you know just help out in some sort of way where should they go uh, so they can find more information about us at insisafoundation.org n-s-e-s-a foundation.org um, they can also contact us at info i-n-f-o at insisafoundation.org and uh, we'll be happy to receive any donations that we can get. And it's all going to go into training young people and helping them become innovative. Man, that, that is so cool. 
And earlier in the conversation, um, when we were talking about um, finding like subcontractors or, you know, just like people to help you complete projects, you mentioned like, oh, we have our own version of Andela or Fiverr. Did you mean that you had like an actual, like there's an actual um, platform that's built to do that? Or were you just saying like informally? Um, well, yeah. So, yeah. So, actually, there is a um, there are platforms that have been built locally by local entrepreneurs in Ghana, uh, where people who have tech skills can be signed onto the platform, and then people who are looking for tech talent locally can actually go over there and recruit those people. So. Um, there is there 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 is that one formally. Uh, so one of it is called Codelin, um, C O D E L N um, dot com, and it's it's locally built to source local talent. Yeah. Wow, that that is so awesome, because that's something that I've been um, doing some thinking about. Like I I really love what um, like Andela has been able to do, and uh, Sama Source also. And so I've, I've been thinking, like, if I were to start a company, I would love to start one like that, that um, hires local talent and connects them to, you know, opportunities all over the world. So yeah. it's great to see that those solutions are already being built locally, for sure. Mm-hmm. Nice. And could you share some advice for any sort of entrepreneurs or technologists on the continent who are looking to solve problems like you are, like what would you say to them to kind of encourage them or, you know, kind of motivate them to, to get started? So, um, yeah, that's what I'll say. One, one, one thing I've already, I've always believed in is that if you really want to do something, you can do it. Um, despite all of the challenges that you are going to face. Um, the solu- the continent actually needs Africa's African solutions from Africa. Uh, we're always used to people coming from outside of the continent to solve our problems. Uh, but we're young, we're people that can actually, we know the problems that affect us the most, and we have to take the uh, take to sorry let me say that again um we know the problems that face us the most and we have to take the driving seat um in solving those problems now in africa the median age now is 19 years which means that there's going to be so many of us youth who face challenges that we need to figure out how to solve ourselves um fortunately there's so much there's never been a time in the history of Africa where there's been such unprecedented opportunities um, to get support to solve problems in Africa. There's so many um, amazing grants, opportunities, funding opportunities that are coming up to help people who have identified pressing African solutions and are desiring to solve them. So the time to start is now. Don't wait for anybody to tell you to start the time to start is now um what solution what problems are around you what solutions can you think of who can you work with come together look for these opportunities and apply for these opportunities raise the funding you need to get this going and trust me if your solution is really impactful you find so much support for it you find so much support for it so don't sit down, get up today, go out there, find a problem, and you get support to solve them. That's my that's my my little thing to just, you know, motivate you, advise you on getting started. Thank you so much for that. And for people who are let's say um they're Africans but living off the continent, so they are, you know, somewhere in the west or, you know, other places how can they contribute to some of the innovation that's happening on the continent? So, like, how could someone in the diaspora 
um, help you or support SESI technologies? Like, is there a way for people to invest or um, maybe advise you or, you know, like how could, how could they or how could we support you even more? Yeah. So um, if you have noticed, a lot of the the world's, you know, biggest companies have realized that Africa is the next biggest place to invest um, your your money because there's so many opportunities here that are begging to be solved. And so if you're looking for a fertile ground where your money can grow, Africa is the place to be. Um, there's so many ways you can support entrepreneurs that are in Africa that are solving impactful problems. You can you can um, invest in their companies. You can um, make donations to them. You know, I met a guy on LinkedIn who is Ghanaian, but has been living, living in the U.S. for uh, 30 years, and who says that, hey, I'm just going to sponsor some farmers. Um, I'm just going to pay so that you can give grain mates to um, five farmers, and I'm just sponsoring, you know, um, farmers to get access to this this innovation um you can do that you can find an african entrepreneur and say hey um i'm giving you this money i'm sponsoring this beneficiary of your solution um and if it's not only about money alone uh, a lot of the time many entrepreneurs want mentorship they want guidance they want someone they can speak to uh, who can give them unique insights in business and how things work if you find yourself in a position where you have skills that are impactful um, and are useful to an entrepreneur. You can volunteer to be a mentor. These are all ways that you can, you know, give back to the community. Uh, so, yeah, um, if you want to help, these are some avenues that you can help with. And so if someone wants to help you directly with SESI Technologies, where should they go? Uh, if someone wants to help with SESI Technologies, uh, they can contact our website is sesitechnologies.com. Uh, I'm sure you probably put in the show notes. Um, yes. My email is isaac at sesitechnologies.com uh, or hello at isaacsesi.com. Um, they can contact me through any of those and I'm very happy to engage with them. Awesome. Yes, I will be sure to include all of that in the show notes. And my last question for you is what excites you about Africa's future? What excites me about Africa's future is, is the young people is the young people. So like I said earlier, we are the youngest generation on the entire planet. Um, which means that we're going to see as uh, the older generation is living and the younger people are coming on board, we're going to see really, really amazing things coming out of the young people on this continent. And this really, really excites me. I don't want to be left out. That is why I have taken the step uh, in sort of helping to shape that African future that we're, we're going to see in, say, 10, 20 years from now. So I'm really excited about the young people in Africa. Love it. Wow. And I feel like that's a, that's the most, that's the um, response I get the most um, when I ask that question. Like everyone's just like young people, the youth, you know, our potential and just all the, all the um, problems, you know, young people can solve. And mm -hmm. yeah, thank you so much for that. And thank you so much for being a guest on the show. I, this conversation was so great. And I can't wait to put it out and hopefully have everyone check out what you're doing. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for, have, for having me. And I... To learn more about SESI Technologies, visit sesitechnologies.com. To learn more about the NCESA Foundation, go to ncesafoundation.org. The links to those are in the episode description. And shoot Isaac an email. Um, get in touch with him and see how you can support or invest in his business. Support a farmer if possible. Um, you know, be a mentor. Um, you know, especially around this time, uh, lots of businesses could use just any sort of additional support. So be sure to get in touch with Isaac and just learn more about everything that he's working on. Also, quick plug 
Dear Diaspora is now on Twitter. So be sure to give the podcast a follow on Twitter. And I will be launching a monthly newsletter starting next month. So be sure to get on the list. Um, Click the link in the episode description and it'll take you directly to the sign up form. Thanks for listening to Dear Diaspora. If you like what you hear, subscribe, rate, and review us on iTunes. You can find us on Instagram at Dear Diaspora or visit our website at DearDiasporaShow.com. Thank you and talk to you next week.